This is showing a picture of the Brunton Bantam stove that I'm using as a comparison. The Brunton stove comes with a multi-tool and as you can see the multi-tool that is uh, provided with the Edelrid Hexon stove is similar. In fact it looks identical except for the inscription that's on the body of the tool. In addition there are um, markings that indicate the wrench size for various um, portions um, of the tool and these are also identical. The jet that is included with the hexon fits the end of that uh, long tube that is seen when you open up the tool and uh, this is for installing and removing the jet but that uh, is the same size on both the hexon multi-tool and the bantam multi-tool. The jets, as a result, appear to be essentially identical in their overall appearance and the thread size is, is essentially the same. I went ahead and um, put some of the jets from the Bantam stove into the Hexon uh, uh, burner area and it fits perfectly. The Bantam stove, however, comes with a different type of jet compared to the Hexon as far as the jet size. It is 0.28 millimeters in contrast to the 0.37 millimeters that is with the hexon. The smaller orifice is more ideal for kerosene type fuels even though the Edelrid uh, instruction manual does not mention any other jet sizes and apparently is um, providing only one jet size for all the fuels that it says that it can use including LP gas, uh, Coleman type fuel, and the um, kerosene. But most of these stoves work optimally uh, with certain fuels with certain jet sizes and the smaller jet sizes typically are used for the uh, kerosene type fuels. I'm also showing some pictures from the um, jets that are on the Primus multi-fuel stove and one of these is uh, 0.28 millimeters and this is for kerosene. The other jet says 3.5, that's 0 0.35 millimeters, and that is for typical Coleman type fuel and similar type fuels. It can also be used with LP gas. Both the Brunton and the Edelrid pumps have mostly metal components with some very high quality plastic portions at the cap, and this is similar to the Primus design, which is also shown. These are high quality pumps. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the Primus bottle on the left and the Edelrid bottle on the right. Although the bottles look similar, the Edelrid bottle is slightly wider in diameter and shorter and can hold a slightly greater amount of fluid. The threads are similar for these two bottles and therefore, in theory, the pump on the Primus can fit the one on the, uh, the Edelrid bottle, but it actually can't because the Primus pump is too long for the Edelrid bottle. The video clips that will be presented now are for primarily the jet installation and removal and also the reassembly of the Hexon stove after it has been disassembled, although the disassembly procedure is essentially the reversal of the reassembly, so it's uh, not that difficult to take it apart. Although this is showing a disassembled model. The principle still applies. Um, this, of course, would be inside the base housing. I have found that the best way to ensure that you don't drop this is to first put the jet into the uh, wrench end here. It has a stop. It will only go so far, so you don't have to worry about it falling in further. And keep it at a slight angle so that it won't uh, drop out as it would be the case if you had it pointed down. And then while you have that in place, just manipulate this into the area of the uh, of where the jet is going to go. Now you have to be careful to make sure you don't cross thread this. And you can tell that just by virtue of the it should go in fairly easily. If it doesn't, then you are cross-threading it, kind of like I'm doing right now. It'll go in extremely easily. 
when all the threads are matched up. And you don't have to wrench this down extremely tightly, just enough to ensure that it's snug. You can see that this bend here in the generator is there in part, I'm sure, to allow this wrench to get into the area for the jet. Otherwise, if it was directly over it, you'd have a heck of a time trying to get it out. Another way to look at this installation of the jet is to have the unit upside down so that you're applying very little force in order to get this into the threads. And again, as long as you have this positioned into the jet area, you don't have to worry about it falling out. But this way also you can tell if you're inadvertently cross-threading things because any significant or any real resistance at all will indicate that you are cross-threading this. Some of the stoves that I've seen in the past allow you to put the jet in with your fingers and therefore you have a good feel for this, assuming you're not freezing to death at the time you're doing this. Fingers against cold metal don't give you a lot of sensation, except cold, that is. Uh, but on the other hand, if you get good enough at this, you don't have to worry about freezing your fingers. But it would be impossible to get your fingers in here. I mean, it, it, the bell is too narrow, and you, you just can't, you can't reach into it. So this tool is what keeps this stove going. Another thing to keep in mind is that, if at all possible, use the cleaning tool that is part of this, this little um, cleaning wire. Try to use this to clean the jet routinely because that way you don't have to worry about removing the jet itself and you probably then only infrequently will need to remove the jet or if you're changing over to a different jet size. You take this wrench end and position it over the jet and if you have done, if you have installed it uh, so that it's not real tight, you should not have to put a lot of effort into removing it and then you just simply unscrew it and what I do is, at this point, is I tilt this so that now when the jet is finally free of the threads, it will fall naturally into the area of the wrench and it won't fall out as would be the case if you had it like that. This is going to show the reassembling of the stove. None of this is included in the very minimalist manual that comes with this. This is the base, of course, and you can see the pad and this small, uh, kind of like a wing nut type thing. It's not real obvious, you can see it there. It's fallen out. And this generator will go inside of here, and this, this nut here will attach from the bottom. For the reassembly, this is of course the base, and I have the, the priming pad and the nut in place, and I'm just going to tilt this so that you can see that the nut has got some uh, bent areas on it, and these are designed to hold down this priming pad, and so the, the little bent areas point down, not up. Now I'm inserting the burner and generator assembly. You can see that there are notches at various points here. Any of these can uh, serve to have this portion of the generator going in properly. And then it fits right into the hole there for the, uh, for the nut that's on the bottom of this. Try to keep the generator tube from touching the housing this will become a little bit more obvious as you are tightening up the nut. But you can see that there's a little bit of play there 
so you can center it as you're tightening up the nut to ensure that this stays away from the housing. I tend to find that by pushing down with my finger on the jet, it will hold the components in place more easily. So I can now turn over the, um, the housing. And this is a lock nut. There's some writing on one side of this nut. I have that facing away from the housing. And then just put this onto the threaded portion there. And then I will use this portion of the tool to tighten it. And again, you don't have to be real tight with this, just enough to snug it down. As you can see, there's not a whole plate, a lot of uh, room here. Getting back to the issue of the generator, I'm now going to make sure that this kind of stays as far away from the housing as possible. You can see that the fuel line is not yet connected, but it's easier, I think, to work with this stove if the fuel line is disconnected. I don't think there's going to be too many instances where you're going to have to, where you're going to find a need to re, uh, disassemble this. The one exception will be the priming pad. Unfortunately, the toolkit that comes with this does not include a separate or replacement priming pad. And I have no idea at this point how you're supposed to get a replacement. I'm not even sure if you require the priming pad in order to get the stove to work. To reconnect the fuel line is fairly simple. You simply screw this back on to this area. One of the points I should mention is that when I initially removed this, it wasn't very easy. There are some little knurled marks here on this portion where I was trying to hold this down with another wrench. Uh, brass, for all of its great properties, is soft metal. So be careful if you're going to take this apart. One suggestion that I might offer, take it for what it's worth, is like what I've done here. This stove has not been fired up at all. And I basically disassembled it in order to free everything up, make sure I knew how everything was put together. And I put a little bit of Vaseline around the threads here. Uh, you can also use some um, graphite uh, powder that's used for locks. Uh, lock mechanisms. Uh, it, it, that's a better idea rather than the Vaseline. But uh, just to make sure that when these parts are put together, they don't stay together when you don't want them to stay together and can free them up without a great deal of effort. Um, I also have a habit of using the graphite uh, um, lubricant on the threads also of the jet, but uh, sometimes that's probably overdoing it. But for this fuel line, I tend to use some kind of a lubricant. And again, I don't wrench this down when I tighten it up very much. I want to make sure that it's snug, but not overly tight. There are no O-rings or any other kinds of uh, spacers as part of this assembly. This small wire here is what is used to clean the generator. You can turn it around and pull it in and out, stuff like that. Again, hopefully not something you need to do very frequently. Once you've gotten to this part, you're essentially home free. All you have to do now is put the spreader plate on. You can see that there are notches at three points that correspond to the positions for this plate. The first two uh, contact points are easy to put into place. The third one snaps, and that is a little bit of effort in order to do that. To free this up, you can use the tool uh, you might have a nice fingernail that you can try as well. Um, probably the tool is the best way. If you pull up one of these, typically it does not require a lot of effort to remove the other two because they, the tension has been released.